What's up, world? It's Rico here, CEO of Search Find Asia, Coast and Made in China podcast, and the host of the Search Find Asia YouTube channel, of course. Back with another, another webinar, and this webinar is a first for SFA. It's going to be one of the first webinars that we do that's not 100% sourcing focused, although we will be talking about manufacturing. The focus of the topic is going to be how to launch, pre launch your product, and get hundreds, if not thousands, of sales before you even start manufacturing. So uh, my co-host of this webinar is Luke Francis, and if you're familiar with my Enterchina days, um, you would have seen me in some videos with him. Um, he basically helps e-commerce businesses gain an audience, uh, validate their product, and get pre-sales through crowdfunding before you start manufacturing your product, which minimizes your risk. So uh, the dates of the webinar will be in the link in the description below and somewhere below me on the screen. And uh, on top of that, I'm gonna pass it on to Luke because he's got a special gift for only the people that attend the webinar live. So this is the first webinar that we're doing in 2020. 20. We're trying to do it big. I hope to see you there. Cheers. Thanks Rico for that introduction. I'm super excited to present this webinar to you on the five steps to get your customers to pay for your first production order. You don't even have to have inventory and you don't even have to put a down payment down for the first order. Your customers are gonna cover all that for you. And I'm gonna show you how to make that happen through strong customer connection, which you can then leverage into a long lasting and meaningful brand, not just a fly by night, get rich quick money grab. And if that sounds interesting to you, then definitely sign up. Um, and, and as a bonus for those that do sign up, I'm gonna hand out a free video that lays out the framework and the foundation for um, building this connection with your customers. And so everybody that signs up, you get that free video um, and I'll deliver that to you. So look in your inbox when you sign up, you'll get the email from me and you can watch that video right away. So look forward to seeing you on the webinar. What's up YouTube, it's Rico here, CEO of Source Financia, co-host of the Main Channel Podcast and the host of the Source Financia YouTube channel, of course, back with another, another one. In this video, I wanted to touch on, it's a common question I'm getting these days from some of the people that are moving to China or thinking about moving to China. Is teaching English still a viable part-time job or full-time job to have while starting a business in China? just preface this with a little bit of a history lesson. So for a lot of people that don't know, the reason why English teaching is such a viable option to coming to China and working part-time or full-time is because quite simply there isn't enough teachers for the amount of students that are that need tutoring. So you know if you're talking 20, 30, 40 years ago, China was completely closed off to the Western world. So you didn't really have that many people learning how to speak English as a whole. And that's the reason why the rise of trading companies happened in Hong Kong is because Hong Kong became the way to enter China. Uh, like literally as a foreigner, you couldn't go into China. It was very difficult to get into China. So that's how the whole trading company industry developed. But then what happened was once China opened up its borders and started allowing people to come in directly and a lot of foreigners are coming in, all of a sudden there's a demand for English speaking you know, local people, people to be in the ground that can either translate or factory workers or salespeople that can actually speak with the clients when they come to the factory. And therefore the trading companies were still dominating. And then what has then happened is now you have this generation of Chinese people that grew up that maybe studied English, but didn't really take it that seriously didn't really see the benefit of it. Now all of a sudden they feel like, oh wow, if I'd taken English more seriously, uh, I would be benefiting more from getting foreign clients. And those people started having kids. A lot of those kids, at the time when they started going to elementary school and high school, English became part of the curriculum. So like I had to study French in high school uh, and, and elementary, I didn't really take it that seriously. It was the same thing with a lot of people that are, I would say anybody that's about 30 below, 30 years of age below, 
had to study English in, in China, had to study English as a second language. On the older side of uh, that range, a lot of them didn't take it seriously and can barely speak. The reading and writing tends to be better, but then you have the younger side, I would say anybody that's at this stage, I would say 25 and below, the, that, that age range, a lot of these kids grew up in an environment where they were consuming more Western culture, uh, watching more Western movies, listening to more Western music, and th their parents, because like I said, the previous generation didn't reap the benefits as much of speaking English and doing business with foreigners, foreign companies, they started to push their kids to study English more, and the, the schools implemented you know, mandatory English as a second language courses, and then of course the rise of demand didn't match the supply for English teachers. So all of a sudden, you know, there's universities that are doing business English as a, as a course. There's high schools, there's elementary and primary schools. And now there's private English tutoring centers that are popping up because they're like, man, these parents will pay and Chinese people, generally the way they approach work is the same way they approach studies. You're going to go to school and then after school, you're gonna go to, English, you're gonna go to private tutoring. So this whole rise of tutoring centers comes up, but there's not enough supply, supply of qualified uh, English teachers that are not Chinese because that, that became a, not a big thing with parents feeling like because they studied with Chinese English teachers their English wasn't as good so they wanted foreigners and ideally foreigners whose first language is English. Then here comes in all the foreigners that aren't qualified <laughs> to speak, unqualified teachers which I was, I was one of them. So yeah, that's how the, de the demand came about for it. Is there's so many students, there's so many, the population of China is so huge, not enough teachers. It was really good. I would say the, the boom or the peak of it was probably around the time when I moved to China, so 2014, 2015. Up until 2017, 2018, the Chinese government started to crack down on this because the problem with having, it's not just the qualifications aspect, it's a lot of people coming to China and they're not, they're not on a proper working visa, but they're making money in China, they're getting paid in RMB. A lot of people coming to China and they're not paying taxes on their, their wages. A lot of the companies, the English teaching centers, paying foreign teachers under the table. So yeah, I mean, the, the Chinese government decided to start to crack down on that. And it became a little bit more difficult for people to, to get English teaching jobs. It has become a little bit more difficult for people to get English teaching jobs in China. Like, okay, so the basic requirements, by the way, if, if you don't know, the basic requirements if you want to get an English teaching job in China on an official working visa is you need to have a college degree. That's, that's the basic requirements. And then ideally, if you come from a country that where English is the first language, then it's, it's also going to be easier to apply for jobs online from abroad. I don't recommend applying for English teaching jobs online from abroad. I recommend that you come to China and go through that process, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah, that's the basic requirements for getting an official English teaching uh, job is, uh, on a working visa. A lot of people, probably most, were here on student visas or on uh, tourist visas and getting, getting uh, English teaching gigs part-time while they do something else. So because it's become more difficult to do that, right now it's more difficult to do it if you're abroad so if you're outside of China and you're looking to get an English teaching job in the traditional way, not traditional, but the, the, the old way that people used to do it, very difficult. The best ways are is if you know somebody already who is working at a school, they can make an introduction for you. But again, the schools are also becoming more strict because they don't want to get in trouble with, with the government. The real best way to do it, which is the way I did it, which is the way most of my friends that I know have done it, and have been success successful with that process is physically coming to China and networking. Like I got my first, well, I was lucky because I got my first English teaching job by putting my, my qualifications on a job site and then I got contacted. Some of my friends who came after me and uh, other people that I knew from Enter China, it was just basically a situation where we would say, hey, I know a friend who has an English tutoring center here's an introduction and then, and also at my actual school that I was teaching at before, I introduced people, uh, potential teachers there. They would reach out to me and say, do you know anybody that's looking to, to teach part-time or full-time at the school? So the answer is it's, it's more difficult now, but it's still a viable option. It just might take you slightly longer to, to get a job and to get a good job, a good paying job. Private tutoring itself is still just an option. Like you can actually, 
if you come to China and you start to network, you build up some relationships with Chinese people, some foreigners, you can literally just be a private tutor. Like I remember one of my one of my friends was a private tutor for different students. Like they he would be traveling around the city to people's houses and tutoring kids, you know, for an hour, two hours, and getting paid sixty dollars an hour, eighty dollars an hour sometimes. But the problem with that is that it's not consistent. So and it can be can be tough, you know, like if you don't have a good base and if people cancel lessons and stuff there, it could be predict it could be difficult to predict what your income is. For me, when I was teaching English, the whole point was it was a means to an end. It was uh, something to keep me sustain my life in China while I was starting my business. So I went and I worked for an actual tutoring center that I, w I was on salary, you know, so it didn't matter how many hours I worked, if I worked more than I was supposed to work, if I worked less than I was supposed to work, I still got paid around the same, or at least I knew how much I was gonna get paid at the end of every month, which basically the trade-off is you get less per hour, but you're guaranteed money versus getting more per hour, but then sometimes students cancel. And another negative thing about working as a, as a private tutor who is getting paid on a class-to-class -class basis is you typically have to work on weekends because that's typically when the students are free. You know, Saturday, Sunday is when the bulk of your classes would be. So there's a few tips around that. So like, I would still say that, yeah, in 2020, teaching English is still a viable option while you're starting a business in China if you want to be living in China. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, again, if you like this kind of content, like, comment, share, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And I will see you guys next week. This webinar is a first for SFA. It's going to be one of the first webinars that we do that's not 100% sourcing focused, although we will be talking about manufacturing. The focus of the topic is going to be how to launch, pre-launch your product and get hundreds if not thousands of sales before you even start manufacturing. So uh, my co-host of this webinar is Luke Francis, and if you're familiar with my Enter China days, um, you would have seen me in some videos with him. Um, he basically helps e-commerce businesses gain an audience, uh, validate their product, and get pre-sales through crowdfunding before you start manufacturing your product, which minimizes your risk. So uh, the dates of the webinar will be in the link in the description below and somewhere below me on the screen. And uh, on top of that, I'm gonna pass it on to Luke because he's got a special gift for only the people that attend the webinar live. So this is the first webinar that we're doing in 2020. 20. We're trying to do it big. I hope to see you there. Cheers. Thanks, Rico, for that introduction. I'm super excited to present this webinar to you on the five steps to get your customers to pay for your first production order. You don't even have to have inventory and you don't even have to put a down payment down for the first order. Your customers are gonna cover all that for you. And I'm gonna show you how to make that happen through strong customer connection, which you can then leverage into a long lasting and meaningful brand, not just a fly by night, get rich quick money grab. And if that sounds interesting to you, then definitely sign up. Um, and, and as a bonus for those that do sign up, I'm gonna hand out a free video that lays out the framework and the foundation for um, building this connection with your customers. And so everybody that signs up, you get that free video um, and I'll deliver that to you. So look in your inbox when you sign up, you'll get the email from me and you can watch that video right away. So look forward to seeing you on the webinar.